you know, when I went into show business, nobody in my family said, you know, it wasn't that old classic story of you, uh, over my dead body, you'll go into that <laughs> horrible profession. It was like, yeah, yeah, make some money. <laughs> Give us some. Hello, welcome to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Ross, and this is where I have conversations about creativity with some of the most incredible artists, musicians, and performers of our time. And today, I'm speaking with Nathan Lane. He's been called the greatest stage entertainer of the 2000s by the New York Times. He's somebody who's mastered his craft from all angles, from movies like The Birdcage and The Lion King to Broadway, where he's done what he calls big comedy. So think Max Bialystok in The Producers. But he's also done some dark, complicated performances like Roy Cohn in Angels in America, and he won Tony Awards for both of those performances. Anyway, on the show today, you're going to hear why Nathan cringes at the label entertainer, how a negative review actually motivated him to make a big pivot in his career, why he thinks that the movie The Producers actually didn't work as a movie, and the process he goes through to first research a role and then become that character on stage. So here's what you need to know before we start. Nathan Lane was born Joseph Lane in Jersey City in 1956. He's the youngest of three kids with two much older brothers. And as far back as Nathan can remember, it was a pretty difficult childhood. His father became an alcoholic and his mother would later suffer from mental illness. But every now and then, Nathan would get a glimpse into the past and what his parents must have been like in happier times. You know, when I was growing up, my father was a truck driver and he didn't drink at all. And my, mo and my mother never drank, but, um, and then as I got older, his, uh, his eyesight was, uh, was going and uh, he didn't want to be driving a truck anymore. And some family connection got him a job with the city uh, as a as a court clerk, um, so uh, I believe it was sort of around that time that he did start drinking. Um, I don't have a lot of um, is, is strong memories of them as a couple. There was the, yeah. there was this one thing I, I I've talked about, which was at a family gathering, sort of a holiday party. Uh, they were playing records, and suddenly my uncle, my, my mother's brother, said, "Why why don't you and and Danny? They were Nora and and Danny mm. Lane. Why don't you get up and dance the way you used to?" And I, I was uh, quite surprised, and they, um, they were hesitant, you know, to, to do that. And they got up and they danced the Peabody, hmm. which is, you know, a, sort of a complicated little dance. And they, they, it was beautiful how they were in sync, and, and they were sort of laughing and enjoying themselves and... Uh, and I thought, how how extraordinary that the, this is happening, and that this side of them that I had never seen, and how in sync they were when they were dancing for these few minutes, and how not in sync they were as a as a couple, and as a husband and wife, and as parents, and and uh, so that's it's very it's it's sort of a happy sad moment. Uh, to remember, um, but there are many of those. But they, um, so my father, yes, became an, an alcoholic, and and my mother had to become the breadwinner, and she got a job as a secretary in the prosecutor's office in Jersey City, and so she was, you know, raising three children on her own. Um, she had me very late in life; she was about forty. It was. Uh, uh, a surprise, and um, and so it, it's um, it's. I mean, look, we all. What is it? What's that? Um, 
uh, Frank McCourt, Angela's Ashes, mm-hmm. you know, the, what's mm-hmm. the, the, this, the, the, about Irish child. Yes. Hoods. Um, and it was very much an Irish childhood, right? Your grandparents actually were immigrants. Both your parents were children of Irish immigrants, I believe. Yes. Yes. Both sides of the family. And yes, and I when, found this all yeah. out on Finding Your Roots. Yes. Right. I, they were able to trace my family back 200 years, although it wasn't uh, terribly interesting. Uh, uh, they were all dirt poor tenant farmers. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, on my father's side, they, they, they didn't own uh, any of the farms. But on, on my mother's side, there was some ownership. And yeah, it was, uh, it's a, a long, sad <laughs> history. Do you, Nathan, you grew up, when you grew up in Jersey City, I imagine yeah. that most of the people around you were from different ethnic backgrounds, Irish, Jewish, uh, Italian, um, which yeah. definitely, um, of course, had an impact on the, 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 the roles you would play and how you would sort of draw on your own experience in those characters. Um, for, from your, in your family, was being Irish very present? Was, w- was it something that you were aware of? Or was it part of your sort of home life and the culture that you were around? Um, uh, yes. I mean, not uh, overtly. There was not, um, I mean, you know, St. Patrick's Day. And <laughs> there was, you know, it wasn't, you know, we were Irish Catholics. Um, I was aware of, you know, I, 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 I was very enamored of Jackie Gleason as a kid. And and sort of fascinated by him and his story, and uh, that he was he was Irish Catholic and and uh, was a self made man. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it certainly was. It it it's it was a it informed one's sense of humor. It's sort of a dark sense of humor, yeah. self deprecating and and um, and. On some days, cynical yeah. <laughs> sense of humor, but uh, it certainly informed that, and uh, and then of course you know Catholicism, which was uh, you know it's based on fear. Yes. So, <laughs> so we all lived in fear <laughs> and guilt. Yeah. Um, you know because of the the uh, I had I had Dominican nuns, which yeah. was a you know an elite task force of. <laughs> <laughs> really, these brutal women <laughs> would teach you the, you know, the famous Baltimore Catechism. Yeah. You, know, you were seven and they would, um, you know, you would have to m- memorize the questions and answers all about theology and God and why did God make you and 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 then, you know, and then repeat it. You know, it was sort of like the Manchurian candidate for seven-year-olds. <laughs> You would memorize this stuff and regurgitate it for these women. This one particular nun who would, you know, sort of, you know, stalk the aisles of the classroom and then whirl around like a Bond villain and slam her hand on the desk and scream, why did God make you? And, yeah. you know, a, a question I ask to this day. Yeah. And um, so, so there was that, <laughs> um, which I... Um, eventually abandoned. Yeah. Did you, were you aware when you were a child that your dad had a, sort of had these ambitions to be a singer? Because he was a, he was sort of an amateur singer, right? I, it was, I think it was mostly family folklore. Hmm. And, and I, how much of that it was apocryphal, uh, how much really happened, I don't, I, I have no idea. Did you hear I, him sing? Uh, I can't recall. <laughs> he was, you know, he, uh, growing up, he was, uh, quite honestly, rarely sober. Um, there were periods that where my mother got him to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and he would stop. And uh, um, and I remember, I can remember my mother telling me, well, when he was sober. Uh, you would you would like stay by his side. You would always you'd follow him around and and uh, hold his hand and uh, you know it was. Um, and I can also remember him saying to me, in in one of these sober moments, um, I remember it was very cold in the apartment and we were sitting in front of the radiator, 
And he said to me, you know, your mother and I aren't going to be around forever. You're going to have to learn to look after yourself. I think I was about nine. Wow. And I was like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I, it was very upsetting. Yeah. And uh, I basically was saying, why, why are you telling me this? Um, so um, I'm sorry. What was the question? Yeah. Did you ever hear him sing? Oh, did I ever hear him sing? Not that I can recall. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, he, yes, they were f- said he was a, had a beautiful Irish tenor voice and that some Hollywood talent scout had seen him and wanted to take him to, to Los Angeles and his mother said no. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether I, I would believe that or not, but that's, th- that was sort of what was passed down to me. You, I know you had older brothers, um, and and one of your brothers, Dan, um, in particular, who you were very close with and are close with, um, kind of introduced you to the theater. They were much older because you were, as you say, you you were your mom was forty when you were born, so you were like really the baby. Well, I wasn't almost forty, but my mother was. Your mom yes. was almost forty. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, although Paul Rudnick has said. <laughs> I I was born a forty year old divorcee. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how did you? How do you? What do you remember about getting a theater? I mean, the story I've heard is that you know, in 1967, your brother took you to your first show, your first show on Broadway. Um, it was it was the show was black comedy. Um, I mean, was right. is that true? Like you went to that show and it was like, wow, what is this? This is like my this. These are my people. This is my world. Was it like that or? Uh, it it wasn't that sophisticated. Okay. Uh, <laughs> these are my people. It was. Uh, I was uh, uh, fascinated and, and a little scared and just wh- this whole thing that was the lights going down and the curtain going up and it was. Uh, it seemed sort of magical and and yes, there was some primitive notion of oh, I'd like to. I think I could do this. I'd like to do this, or at least I'd like to do it. Whether whether I'd be good at it, it was. But you debatable. liked watching it, of course. You. Loved oh sure. It. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, before that, he had volunteered my services for a play that was being done at his college, and they needed a child, and and that's how how it began. He before he even took me to plays, he he put me in one. <laughs> Um, a play by Frank Gilroy, the author of The Subject with Roses, called Who'll Save the Plowboy? Um, I don't think that, I don't know if that made it to Broadway or not, but uh, in the second act, there was a child, and so I made my stage debut in that play at um, what was then known as Jersey City State College. <laughs> and um, and was... Uh, I, I so I was about ten, maybe. I, I yeah. honestly don't remember. But he, yeah, and and was I was very upset when I was not allowed to go to the opening night cast party. Mm. I was incensed because you, yeah. <laughs> you were a kid <laughs> and, and stormed uh, stormed yeah. off home, thinking why why am I not allowed to go to the party? I I know that um, you really got into theater in high school. Um, you went to, uh, again, a Catholic high school. Um, a, a St. Jesuit Peter's run, Prep in Jersey Jesuit City. High School, yes. right? Um, and uh, you're one of the most famous alums because they, I mean, they talk about you. They're so proud of you. You were known as Joe Lane there. Um, how did you, what do you remember about getting involved in theater and drama at school? I mean, you know, I'm sure there were other kids who were into sports or maybe the student government or something. What what I mean, obviously, you had been exposed to theater at a young age. Your brother had taken you to to a show. Yeah, kind of got interested. Um, and I had done so, plays in in grammar school mm. uh, as well, as well as my college debut. I I was in. Uh, I, we did around the world in eighty days in grammar school. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was. It's. It seemed like a natural thing. I'm sure it was also an escape. It was. Uh, um, it, but it. Uh, yeah, they put on like two plays a year, as I recall, at, at St. Peter's Prep, and and uh, so. And there was a guy. 
his name was Kibler, hmm. was the first guy, and he was uh, he ran, he was sort of in he was a a married guy. He was uh, uh, his, what was his first name? I can't remember, Mister Kibler, hmm. but he was like really worked out pumped up like he had been a gymnast or something. I think he might have run the gym team too. But he was in charge of uh, the drama society. Mm. And and uh and he cast me in in plays and he and he thought I was hilarious. So I thought he was great. Um yeah. So th- I mean you were you were voted the best actor in your high school. You were I mean people remember <laughs> you as this talented and charismatic stage actor and i wonder i mean just just for a moment i guess you know you have this very volatile or you know i maybe that's not the right word but very difficult home life right your dad he passed away when you were a kid your mom 11 struggled yeah 11 your mom struggled with mental illness um and basically yeah your brothers kind of helped raise you but I it, every time I've I've seen you describe your childhood, it's it's not with bitterness or s- a sense of sadness. And I wonder, is that how you perceive it? That when you think of your childhood, do you think, oh, it was a really sad childhood, or do you think, you know, I I did theater and and I found other outlets and I I, I made it through. It was fine. Uh, I think that, you know, I think that's just uh, sort of a family thing. You yeah. know, what's uh, what the Abraham Lincoln line? I, if I didn't laugh, I'd cry. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's no worse than a lot of childhoods. And, and there's certainly been a, a lot worse than mine. But it was, it was, um, I'd certainly, we, I, I think all three, uh, the Lane boys, you know, bear some of the scars of that, you know, yeah. that's that we've had to come to terms with um, growing up, you know, my, yeah, my, you know, it was it was during that when I was in high school, that's when uh, my mother's, uh, uh, my grandmother, my mother's mother had passed away and she had left my father uh, finally uh, yeah. and we moved out. And he, there was like another month he had on the apartment and he was, he drank himself to death, essentially. So he died and my grandma, uh, first my grandmother died and then he died. And the combination of that really hit my mother very hard. And then for a long time, they couldn't, they didn't even know how to diagnose what was happening other than it was some sort of mental breakdown. She had an overactive thyroid one person said and then uh eventually it was diagnosed uh, as what they as what they used to call manic depression or and now bipolar disorder but she uh, and then eventually was got on lithium and and that helped her a great deal but um it was difficult to uh, to live with as a high school kid because she was there were there were periods where she would like a long period of time where she would be just depressed, yeah, uh, and just sat in a, a house dress all day and and uh, doing nothing and was kind of suicidal. We um, and then and then she would be in a mental hospital and then she would get out and then she became very manic and would um, buy things when she didn't have the money, just hmm. uh, charge things. And um, uh, yeah, it was, she, it was really crazy. And then she became very paranoid. And um, this, I remember this is all during Watergate. And she would hmm. say, you know, Nixon wasn't the president. They're all lying to us. And I said, well, they, they may be lying to us, but he's <laughs> unfortunately the president. Um, so uh, there were, yeah. It, I mean, it, I, I we could do a whole podcast just we could. on that. We could just but on that. And I mean, a, eventually, it, you know, uh, uh, um, after all, a, a period of about five years, all the way through high school, she finally it was diagnosed as manic depression, and mm. and she was put on lithium. So I mean, it sounds like theater. I mean, the long hours that you would probably spend preparing, rehearsing for plays in high school kept you out of the house, basically. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a house with 
presumably as a teenager with a mom who was, you know, well, going through that. I, I, you mean I, I had to be there. I, I, at a certain point, both my brothers got married, and it was just the, my mother and myself. Mm. So I had to be. I, I, you know, would would cook. Yeah. And and you know, look after the apartment, and um, yeah, I had to grow up very quickly. So, but I'm, and I'm sure, I mean, you know, the um, acting in plays was also a, a social thing. Um, uh, and, and also it was an outlet for whatever was going on inside of me. Do you, do you remember in, when you were in high love. school? I was looking for love, guy. <laughs> Just a little bit of love. Do you, do you remember somebody when you were in high school saying to you, Nathan, I think you should pursue this professionally. You're, you're not just good. You're really good. You're like, like, see that kid over there playing basketball? He's going to college to play basketball. Like, you um, are so good at this. You should do this professionally. Did anybody ever tell you that? I'm sure somebody did. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, did you feel Mr. that? Did you feel Mr. that you had? After Mr. Kibler, there was yeah. a guy named Jack Casey who took mm. over, who was, the, he was an incredible chain smoker. This is now after, this is 47 years later. I realized he lived with his mother. He was probably a repressed homosexual, and he was a total alcoholic mm. and very nervous. He was very nervous. This guy needed to get laid. And uh, he might have said it. Uh, I certainly, I'm sure my brother Danny you know, uh, might have uh, it was always very encouraging. I mean, he forced me into it. He forced me into the theater. Yeah, uh, I think after they tried to, uh, my two brothers tried to interest me in sports, and we realized that wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> Where they, we threw a football around, and I finally stopped and said to them, "You know, I am not a sportsman." I believe I said to them. Um, so. Yeah, it. it uh, I'm, I'm sure, and I'm sure, and on inside, I said, I think maybe I could do this. Hmm. Were you? Did you feel confident on stage? I mean, when you when you said inside, you felt maybe I could do this. Did you? Well, it was like an adrenaline yeah. rush. It was like yeah. heroin. It was yeah. like I don't know. There was some something that happened, and a connection to the audience, and just the there was a freedom that I didn't have in life. And a, in in many ways, I was more comfortable on stage. I guess because I was in control. <laughs> do you remember? I mean, do you remember? Because you didn't you for for a variety of reasons, you did not end up going to college in large part because you couldn't afford to pay the tuition. Yeah. But did you already know when you were eighteen that this was what you were going to pursue a a, a professional? life as an actor well it, you know it was it, that it was this odd story of going my brother danny driving me to this i had this uh, st joseph's college in philadelphia and i had gotten i had auditioned for them and gotten a drama scholarship and then when we got there they said uh, i know i had a government loan and a student loan and they they said oh i i still owed more money and I was uh, going to have to take out another loan. And that's when I said to my brother, oh, that's uh, – I was some big, very concerned about this, not knowing Joe Biden would one day forgive all my student loans. Uh, I, if I'd only known, if I could had a crystal ball with Joe Biden that would solve this, I would have I gone to this school. But instead, I, he said to me, well, nobody says you have to go to college now. You could take a year off and work mm. and, and earn the money and, and then go. And so I said, OK, let's get out of here. And I went back to home to Jersey City. And somebody, maybe the same family connection who got my father the job as a court clerk, which led to his alcoholism, he got me a job as as a bail interviewer at the seventh precinct in Jersey City. Perfect where, job, right? Perfect job. And anyone who was arrested was brought to me, <laughs> and I would have to fill out the paperwork for the court clerk to see to determine whether they could be released on their own uh. recognizance. <laughs> so I only did this for you know a couple of months, <laughs> and, and then um, there was a little non-equity theater company. Uh, the the uh, what was the name of it? 
the Halfpenny Playhouse mm. that had a little theater in residence at Uppsala College in East Orange, New Jersey. And I had worked for them one summer, and they were putting together a musical review about the history of New Jersey called Jers that was going to be touring schools. It was all leading up to the up, the upcoming bicentennial. And so that's and uh, yeah, that that's I I was working for them um, after I left the seventh precinct. Uh, pretty good move, you think? Well, I think was, so. You know, I made a it little bit of money, well. and it was uh, quite an experience. But you were still, I mean, you know, probably at this point making almost no money. Uh, yeah. But and but you weren't just across the, the the river from New York. I mean, you're in Jersey. You know, you're in Jersey. So you're in yet right? so far, yes. And um, and the center of the theater world, um, you I guess understandably moved to New York City. Um, you know, in in, in your early twenties, uh, or maybe yeah, maybe twenty twenty one. Um, and I th- I guess one of the things you did for a living was as a like did singing telegrams, which I don't know if they exist as much anymore. But it was a th- big thing back in the day. Like you knock the, on someone's the, door in the late seventies. You yeah. like sing right. Yes, sadly, I would I would sing. Uh, yeah, birthday greetings to the to the William Tell Overture. To the William, like to the yes, it's your day, it's your day, it's, yesterday is here, so we're sending you some musical cheer. Yes, amazing. I would si- sing that. Uh, yeah, why they felt it had to be public domain? I don't. Who was going to check? If, you, if you're in an office building. You, I mean, imagine if, if if people had feeling iPhones. Feeling groovy. I mean, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said, imagine if people had like iPhones back then. They could film you and then they would say, Nathan Lane as a young man was my singing telegram. Yeah. I, oh, man. And yeah, and they gave you like a bad tuxedo and a, and a felt <laughs> top hat that wasn't quite big enough. And... Um, I always say that I, one, one, uh, telegram, I, a birthday telegram I delivered to Sam, young Sam Waterston, who I, wow. I loved as an actor. And I, so I went to, there was an apartment, I don't know whether it was his apartment or not, but they were having a birthday party for him. And, and, um, you, you know, it's, you know, you lived for tips of course, and uh, but he was quite generous. I think he, he he thought this is so sad. Here's a struggling actor having to do singing telegrams, and I just remember he was very, very kind and generous. Wow! Did you ever tell yeah. him that story? I, I've never. Uh, I I don't. I don't think I've ever met Sam. I've never, and I've never gotten to work with him. But I, it's it. Yeah, it's true. He was he was lovely to me. Many many years ago, uh, it's an important lesson, right, for all of us to remember. Because somebody, you may have been nice to somebody, and then twenty years will say Nathan Lane gave me a twenty dollar bill for just uh, yeah, opening well, we the won't, door. Won't talk about what I gave him a twenty for, but <laughs> wasn't singing. Hey, good night. <laughs> Is this where I go? I, I I I storm off and go to the bathroom. Isn't that what you said might happen? We I could do anything I wanted. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. If you could, yeah. Um, when, when you were, I mean, when you were starting out, right? And this is kind of normal, right? You were doing sort of workshops and 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 trying to kind of you know get roles here and there. But um, do you remember feeling? frustrated that you weren't getting you know bigger roles or that you weren't like breaking in or or did, did oh you dear feel like... god no 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 and for some reason I, I i don't know why especially coming from this chaotic family background i i i i always thought it was gonna work out that i would have to go through this a period of of struggle uh, and I went through a long period of struggle. Um, and uh, w- when I first moved to New York, um, I had been working a lot, aside from with the Halfpenny Playhouse, I've been working a lot in non-equity theater. And then through, th- through that theater, got my equity card doing a musical about the metric system called One for Good Measure. And then when, when I got the card, I, I, I stopped working. 
uh, I couldn't get equity jobs. And then what saved me was doing um, commercials. I did a lot of commercials. And, and then started to do little off-off Broadway things, little review here and there, and then which led to me working with a, uh, another actor, and we put together an act. We were a comedy team, which is what led me going to L.A. This is Patrick um, Stack? Patrick Stack, my good friend Patrick Stack to this day. And um, so it was, it was another way in. And, and, and this suddenly, for, you know, a, a short period of time, we, we had some success and we signed with William Morris and had a Beverly Hills manager and went to L.A. and showcased at the Comedy Store. And, there's, and, a video, there was, there's a video of the two of you that, that you can see on YouTube. Performer watched it. Um, uh, was this on the of, Merv Griffin show? It was on Norm Crosby's Comedy Show. Oh, Norm shop. Crosby's Comedy Show. Yes. Sure. And, that went uh, well. It was good. It was really funny. I don't know. Um, I think well, some of those jokes you couldn't tell today um, yeah. for a variety of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't – really? What, what, I don't know what we could get away with on television. We used to do a sketch about two guys at a singles bar, and and uh, one – I was the sort of not very – I was very inept at, at meeting ladies, and then – my partner, who's a big, tall, good-looking guy, would said, "If all else fails, you and he would put a, a cucumber down his pants. <laughs> he had a huge cucumber. He said, just stick this down in your pants and slow dance, <laughs> and things will change.' And so we did a whole physical comedy with the, me trying to put this cucumber down my pants, which are too baggy, and it would slide through, and it would look, you know, it was too big. So, so anyway." Um, I remember that. We did a character called the Reverend Billy Sissy based on Ernest Angley, the faith healer, the Reverend Billy Sissy. Uh, um, yeah. And what, and anything? What, I'm trying to think of what, would, what wouldn't go over now. <laughs> probably all yeah right. no i mean it it was all very funny just you know jokes i think prob prob probably uh you know jokes about like and then uh, you know like uh, and and then the, the the my wife died in the fire and then you know sort of something like sort of laughing oh. and yeah oh oh that's that you know that's like some we used to do that there was a hoary old vaudeville we it was an example of we we used to talk about it and we did this thing Two guys running into each other. That's good. That's that's, that's good. good. That's bad. Yeah. 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 No, I know. It, it yeah. was literally an old vaudeville <laughs> thing. Um, um, <laughs> but did you did you think? I mean, sort of moving and sort of from the the stage and and going into do, doing this comedy duo that you pursued. Um, I mean, did, was was that? Did you think that maybe this is the direction I'll go in? Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I won't be a stage actor. Maybe I'll get into comedy. No. No. No, it was, it was just a means to an end. It was, it was a very freeing uh, learning experience. It was, it was a, um, a way of, uh, uh, it, you know, having a product that we could take around because, uh, you know, as an actor, you're just dependent on being cast. And this was something, it was our, we, it, 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 it's how I, I started as, as a writer. And then, um, uh, we, um, and so I, uh, oh, there's, there's someone at my window here. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, somebody, you know, I hope. Yeah. yeah uh, no, oh. no, no, they're just, uh, they're, they're dealing with, uh, we, we had the house painted and then oh. the windows were painted shut. So oh. we're, uh. Unshutting them, unpainting. We're dealing. Them shut. We're dealing with that. So anyway, uh, yeah, comedy. No, I always thought. Uh, I never thought we were going to become the next Nichols and May. It was, you know, it was. Um, it, it was hopefully leading to other work as actors. And ni yeah. neither one of us thought this is. Oh, this is what our our end goal. But it's interesting. I mean, if you knew you, because it seems like you knew even from the beginning when you were in New York that you had to go through a period of struggle. You had to kind of grind your way and do do workshops and maybe small parts here and there. But that you did not worry about what was going to happen in the future. That you always knew that it was going to work out somehow. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I don't. 
<laughs> it's not the power of positive thinking. Um, it was, I just, some, something, some gut instinct, something said, it's, it is going to work out. Uh, I'm, I, I, you know, whatever struggles I, I had to go through, I, I all, always sort of knew it was going to work out. And you, and and, yeah. and I don't I don't know why belief belief in myself or belief in ta my talent or just you know I would I would sort of look at it as if it was a movie, and I would think this is like the beginning of the movie, <laughs> and eventually things will will pay off. You you remember feeling that way that that my because this is this is an important point you're making and I'll I'll, I'll I'll give my perspective in a moment but you remember thinking this is like the part in my life story where this happens and this is supposed to happen and then yeah. that will eventually happen yeah yes yeah it, you know i would sort of it was like a little fantasy this is like this is i'm like in the movie of my life and this is the early part <laughs> no i mean it's, I it's so it, it's so interesting that you say that because there are there are literally you know books about about this and how to think about your life, particularly in challenging times, which is to kind of separate yourself from the moment and observe yourself, almost like you right. are, like almost like you're Joan Didion writing about yourself or something. You know, that period of struggle can often be very, very lonely and 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 depressing because you you don't know. There's so much uncertainty. You don't know if you're you're going to make it. You don't know if somebody's going to give you an opportunity. Um, but right. you seem to be okay with that uncertainty. You seem to be okay with it. Yeah, well, well, my my family life was yeah. uncertain, yeah. and um, and and you know when I went into show business, nobody in my family said, you know, it wasn't that old classic story of you uh, over my dead body you'll go into that <laughs> horrible profession. It was like, yeah, yeah, make some money, <laughs> give us some. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it wasn't all that different. It was like there was a great deal of uncertainty, but that's that's all they ever tell you. But it was what I loved doing. It was what uh, gave me fulfillment and 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 for some reason I was, you know, I was a scrappy youth. I was I was out there hustling and, you know, I went and suddenly I was in stand-up comedy for 20 minutes and yeah. And it was a really uh, it was a great learning experience. And then, um, you know, it helped me when eventually what brought me back to New York was doing a, this uh, terrible little sitcom with Mickey Rooney and Dana Carvey. And, you know, they, they, this they is called wanted... One of the Boys? One of the Boys. Uh, with, and, and we, um, you know, they wanted when I auditioned, you know, to, if you could ad lib or improvise. And so um, after having that the comedy experience it was incredibly helpful to me and um and so the, yeah that it brought me back to new york uh and you know i knew it i i knew it wasn't going to with all the uncertainty in show business i did know that wasn't going to last and then um i wound up um auditioning for uh, this revival of Present Laughter at Circle in the Square that George C. Scott was directing and starring in. I want to ask you about that, but before I get there, um, I, I should mention that that show, One of the Boys, which only, which I think only ran for a few episodes, also 13. included... We, 13. We made episodes, 13. Also included the young Dana Carvey and Meg Ryan. Meg so, Ryan. And Nathan Lane. So some big stars Scat came Man out Scatman Crothers. Scatman Crothers, didn't know that. Yeah, uh, but but, it's, you know, you didn't have the money to go to the conservatory or you know to do that kind of work, and really, you kind. It sounds like you sort of made that for yourself by doing workshops and then doing the comedy thing because I imagine. I mean, as you say, you had to learn how to improvise, right? You had to learn how to just be quick. Well, and I never things. no. I mean, I never really. Um, I was just. Uh, Quick-witted. I, I I never was really an improviser in that sense, and uh, the, in the yes and second city yeah, yeah. type way. But, um, uh, uh, um, you know, it's more about writing skills sometimes, yeah. and um, yeah, it, uh, um, 
you know, I did go to, uh, I went for, for a summer session at the Stella Adler studio and it wasn't, it wasn't Stella. It was her cousin Pearl. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and uh, at, at the time, I was a little too abstract for me. It was a lot of yeah. touchy feely. Look out the window, and then come back and describe what you see. And they were, oh, I saw a cloud that looked like my grandmother's face with tears coming. You know, and there was all sorts. I saw a homeless person, and it reminded me. You know, and she said to me, "What do you see? What did you see, Nathan?" I said, "I see four hundred dollars going down the drain." Um, <laughs> And then I studied with a woman named Joan Bellomo, uh, who ha- had studied. Who did she study with? Uh, I don't know. She had studied with someone good, <laughs> and she had a, a small acting class, and and sh- she was incredibly helpful to me. And then the rest of it was just experience, which I yeah. think is ultimately the best teacher, and working with good people. Did you want to be a comedy actor? Did it, I mean, obviously that that's what you became. I mean, you do dramatic roles later on but did you want did you feel like that was where your talent was well uh, sure yeah i mean i just wanted to work you know that it wasn't about what kinds of roles it it uh it yeah but obviously that's my gift was i had a gift for comedy and so that's that's uh, where i excelled and and then and then also in in the occasional musical um you made your Broadway debut in 1982, this play uh, called Present Laughter alongside George C. Scott, who I mm. think was like, am I wrong to say he was kind of one of your idols? Sure. I mean, I, I, people don't, I, I, I would venture to say a lot of people don't remember him, but he was an extraordinary actor uh, on film and, and really, you know, but really more of a stage actor he was you know famously in the early days of the public theater he did a uh, an amazing shylock in the park he was um he, you know he had incredible range and and just as you know a great character actor star who uh, was also incredibly self-destructive alcoholic you know right right up my alley i i totally understood him and he was very um he was he was very kind to me. Uh, I'm sure Ava Gardner had another story, but he was incredibly kind and paternal with me. Interestingly, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and the whole experience was, you know, look the after the first read through, he famously said. <laughs> I I always laugh at these things, and people say, "Why do you laugh?" And he said. You know what I like about this cast? No fags, he said. And and Dana Ivey, who was sitting next to me, turned to me and said, I'm I'm sure he meant that in a nice way. And thus a friendship was born. Um, but he, you know, for all of his, you know, crazy conservative right wing stuff, um, and issues uh he was i mean he was a, an electric actor to be on stage with and and was um he was and and equally adept at comedy as he was at drama and so he was hilarious a, a very obviously unexpected casting in the Noel Coward role in it was more like John Barrymore in Present Laughter but he was hilarious and totally had a had no problem for all of what he what he just said t- Totally had a sense of camp. His Gary Essendine had a, a hint of mint, and yeah. and was uh, but really a, a great comic performance. And and uh, and then I worked with him like nine years later. We did. Uh, he wanted to do uh, this Paul Osborne play on borrowed time, which was um, a really hokey old piece. But he where he played uh, lovable old Gramps. And I was the uh, the angel of death, Mr. Brink. Um, but yeah, I, I, I for, you know, he had his issues, of course. But I, I, I loved him, and was always very grateful to him for his support and giving me that opportunity. Do you remember in any? You were twenty six when you debuted on Broadway alongside George C. Scott. I mean, he was a legend. I mean, he had won an Academy Award. He was, in, he was in, he was in. He turned Dr. it Shanslow. down, but yes. 
Yeah, uh, Doctor Strange that, right? love. Christmas Carol. I mean, the, the guy is legendary at, on film and and on stage. Were you nervous about being alongside somebody like that? Do you oh, sure, sure. Nervous? He was terrifying. <laughs> we, we were all terrified of him. He was, you know, he was just an intimidating figure. He was a huge yeah. guy. Yeah, and um, you know the. The good news was when we did that show, he had made a bet with the producers, with Paul Libet and Ted Mann, that he would. They said, "We bet you you can't stay sober for three months." <laughs> so he did, which was, you know, they knew what they were doing, and you know, and then uh, like three months in, we we had been the play open was a big hit, so uh, I, you know, a couple couple of months into the run. He turned to me after a Sunday matinee and said, that's it. I won the bet. Now I'm going to get shit faced. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then he was out for a week. (laughs) And then the entire cast called him and left him a message saying, George, please come back. You know, we're in a we're in a big hit, a star vehicle without the star. And um, people are nobody's showing up. Please come back. And he did. And then he was well-behaved for the rest of the run. Nathan, I think in that play, I mean, you're 26, you're making a Broadway debut, you're alongside George C. Scott, and there was a review of that play in The New Yorker, and there's a line, and I know you know this line, that the the critic writes about your (laughs) performance. Brendan Gill, Uh, he's dead now. grotesquely amateurish. That that what he said? Didn't he say, I thought he said I was a rank amateur who should never be allowed on the stage. Not quite that um, no. uh, intense. It said his performance struck me as grotesquely, grotesquely amateurish, and um, that that is, I mean, you know, must have been a blow to your confidence. Or how do you remember responding to that? Was it sort of crushing, or did you just say, "Screw that guy," or whatever? I'm going to keep fighting. Uh, I I remembered then years later doing an American Theater Wing seminar, and he was the moderator, and him telling me what a big fan he was. Wow. Um, the, the reviewer. Yeah, Brendan Gill. Um, <laughs> look, you have to understand, we were doing a Noel Coward play, but George's take on that particular character was, I want you to be like an insane, stalkerish fan. of you know. So do crazy things. You know, walk on the furniture. Do whatever you, do whatever you want. Yeah. And so... <laughs> You know, so I did weird things, and um, uh, um, yeah. did you care? I, so it did was a, so it was about... what what some people might politely say a brave a brave yeah. performance because I went for it only because it was George C. Scott. I would have done anything he asked, so yeah. he wanted me to you know do do stuff and and take a chance. And, and make it more than just, oh, he's sort of obsessed, just obsessed. He, he wanted to be a little more dangerous. So, uh, I mean, you know, let me tell you, uh, we got big laughs. We got a lot of laughs, George and I, as a team. Um, so, I, you know, I, it seemed to be successful with the audience. Um, but... Yeah, I'm sure for some critics it was, you know, I think Frank Rich said I was hit and miss. <laughs> you know what? It's sort of, yes, I remember standing on the corner of 44th Street and 9th Avenue uh, holding the New York Times and with a couple of friends and reading the Frank Rich review that said I was, it was a hit and miss performance. Mm. And and being, you know, depressed by it mm. because it was my Broadway debut. But, yeah. um, you know, now Frank Rich is a friend. And a great writer. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 yeah, I, yes, of course, of course, you know, there were, yeah. you, you know, fr- yeah, there were, there, you know, Frank Rich ruined several nights. <laughs> Of mine. How did you? Here's my question about this, about criticism, because the overwhelming response uh, over the course of your career has been positive, right? Overwhelmingly positive, whether it's audiences or critics. Are you a person who who absorbs that and really 
you know, appreciates that? Or are you a person who tends to focus on that one negative review? Oh, the, the, the negative. That's what everybody yeah, – that, I don't care what anybody – somebody, can, they can tell you, oh, I've been through therapy and I don't read reviews. And they're all full of shit. That's all you've – if there's somebody – if an audience can be rolling in the aisles, but there's one guy staring at you and you're trying to figure out why isn't he laughing. There's one negative – you remember all the negative reviews. If, 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 if the response to me has been overwhelmingly positive, I don't remember any of that. What I yeah. remember are the bad ones, the ones where they, they said, you know, this, this man should be, you know, arrested. <laughs> there must be <laughs> – what's his name? Uh, uh, Robert Brewstein, that barrel of laughs. He once said of me uh, uh, about my performance in Love, Valor, Compassion, he said, Nathan Lane is an irrepressible force who should be forcibly repressed. <laughs> <laughs> Which at least was witty. Did, yeah. did, you ever, did you ever read reviews and say, okay, I'm going to use this to make myself better or did you just... Did they just make you angry? Were there ever reviews were that were critical and you thought, okay, that's fair. I, I Maybe I'll think about that. Well, you, you know, you start to – I mean, you know, overall, you can read a bunch of reviews and there you, maybe there's a kind of consensus that might make sense uh, or might give you one pause. But um, f for the most part, no. I mean, what happens is – I mean, first of all, I've outlived a lot of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I've outlived a lot of them. And uh, they, you know, you have, you, even though you don't know them personally, it's, you know, especially when they're writing, you know, you, there's a relationship that develops. They have a, you know, and some people like you, some people, you know, uh, hate you and then, and then sort of grow to like you. Some people love you and then grow to hate you. It, it's, they're, they're human beings. They're just human beings who, who didn't get enough love in their lives and, and didn't have the talent to go into the profession. And so they stand around and tell you what you're doing wrong. So, you know, and some of them are, there was a, the day of the gentleman critic and, the, you know, and there was, and they would just point out things. And now it's become all very personal. And I, 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 you know, I went to see the show with my, you know, my friend or my cat or whatever it is. And you're like, what? I don't want to hear about you. I want to hear about the evening. Anyway, it's, it's all changed. And then it and the, now it's become very nasty and bitchy and snarky and, you know, mm. um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I haven't been on stage now in, in about four years. I'm, I'm going to do something in the in, in, uh, next January. So, I, it's, you know, it's like I don't know anybody anymore who, who's reviewing. or It's all, it's all going to be brand new. Um, but, you know, one time, one time, one thing had an effect. And it was, it was Charles Isherwood. <laughs> and this was I I had done uh I was doing this musical The Adams Family which was mm -hmm. reviled yep. by the critics. You were, and then you were Gomez, the, right? Yes, and then the public didn't care. They liked the brand and they wanted to see it and so it ran. So I had a uh you know, I was contracted for a year. So, you know, I had a lot of time to think. And during this period Charles Isherwood wrote um, a, a very, very complimentary piece, uh, uh, an assessment piece about my career, in which he referred to me as the the you know one, the last of the great stage entertainers right. or something, the, the, great, something the greatest the yeah, greatest stage right. entertainer yeah. of the last decade. Yeah, and being Irish, I can find the dark cloud in any silver <laughs> lining. And That's so a pretty great thing to say. The word entertainer stuck in my craw. They, it, it rubbed me the wrong way for some reason. And I thought, who am I, fucking Al Jolson? You know, am I working children's birthday parties? Am I opening for Wayne Newton? Fuck you. I'm an entertainer. I'm, I've been an actor. At that point, I've been an actor for 35 years or something. Yeah. So it was... it. It, it made me a little crazy and I and it made me think uh, I felt like I was a, at a bit of a crossroads and I you know this perception you know I, I had I had mainly 
done been in plays but uh, you know a handful of musicals that were successful and and um so i had that musical comedy taint that's hard to get rid of it's like it hangs on you like a bad suit and i wondered if i could change this perception even just a little and i and i i thought i have to challenge myself i have to scare myself again and I wonder if, uh, and, and, and challenge the audience as well. And would they go along with me on that kind of a exploratory journey? And so, and literally around the same time, I read an interview with Bob Falls, and who I just paid tribute to in Chicago. He's stepping down from the Goodman Theater after 35 years. The great Bob Falls and my, my late great friend, Brian Dennehy, in which they were discussing their legendary collaborations in Chicago theater, some of which made their way to New York, like Death of a Salesman and Long Day's Journey. So they're talking about doing, um, uh, uh, perhaps revisiting The Iceman Cometh, which they had done in 1990 very successfully in Chicago, uh, where Brian played Hickey. And now in a new production, he would play Larry Slade. And they, they... suggested an actor, a highly respected actor who might possibly play Hickey in that production. And I won't tell you who it was because you'll think, oh, too bad he didn't do it. And so I, so, and, and I thought he doesn't need this. You know, I need this. I need to shake things up. And what could shake things up more than the Iceman cometh? You know, when he walks in the door, you, the first thing you think is he probably just killed his wife. And, you know, I thought I, I kind of when I you read the O'Neill overly descriptive, uh, dis- o- over- <laughs> overly descriptive descriptions of the characters. You know, I thought it sounds like me. And what if we tried to fulfill that? Yeah. You know, I thought, isn't it? It, w- it would be an interesting dynamic if. Uh, because the audience feels that way, the, feels the same way that the guys in the bar feel about Hickey. He's here to show us a good time, and then we pull the rug out from under them. It's an interesting starting point. And then, you know, as as things go on and it becomes a little more malevolent and, and emotional and, and the rage, you know, it'll come as uh, more of a surprise in what, you know, has to be the most obvious murder mystery in history. Um So uh, that's what I wrote to Bob Falls. I got his email and I sent him this email, which, you know, we we didn't know each other that well. We had met briefly once and I sent him an email and suggesting all this, why I should play Hickey. And and if they did this, I would hope he would consider me. And then I didn't hear from him for a bit. And I thought, oh, I, I overdid it. You know, he's probably gotten a restraining order. And I should just put a club act together and forget this crazy shit. But then I heard from him and he said he wanted to uh, sit down and talk about it. He said there was no production planned, but if I was interested in doing it um, with him and Brian, then he, let's try to work it out. And it's eventually what led to me going to Chicago, Chicago to do Iceman and play Hickey. And it was a life-changing experience. And this is right after the Adams Family? Pretty much, yeah. Well, wow. and and you feel like, for you, you needed to do that because it was triggered in part because of this perception that you felt that was around you that you were an entertainer. I just felt I had I I don't mind being entertaining. No, <laughs> but I I felt I had more to offer as an actor. Yeah, and that I was primarily an actor. Yes, I'm funny on talk shows. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, you know, I'm good at the comedy, but, you know, I think if anyone was, not that they should, but if anyone was paying close attention and they'd seen me in the works of Terrence McNally or John Robin Bates or Simon Gray or, uh, you know, uh, we did, I did the first revival of, uh, Waiting for Gatto on Broadway with Bill Irwin. I, you know, it's not like I've, I'm just slumming, um, there's been a lot of variety. So, uh, but what people remember are the big successes like like uh, Guys and Dolls, Funny Thing Happened on Way to the Forum, uh, The Producers, uh, and, and The Birdcage. So I felt like 
uh, uh, I, I, I just needed to shake things up personally, you know, whether anyone would uh, recognize that uh, was another matter. And, and by some miracle, it, over a, a period of time from, from that moment in, in Chicago doing Iceman to today, there was a shift, a slight shift, so that by the time we got to, I got to Angels, someone asking me to play Roy Cohn in Angels in America at the National Theater, it wasn't, it wasn't like uh, a shock. Or as someone said in the New York Times when I was going to do Hickey, uh, an Iceman in Chicago, that he thought he was reading an, an Onion headline. Right. Right. Because Roy Cohn was obviously... Um, a very, a very not funny role at all. Um, oh, he, it, oh, I, I, I would disagree. I Roy Cohn is <laughs> is a very funny role, and but he's but it's also he's you know evil personified. Yeah, you know he's a he was a complicated guy. I you know I've pretty much now cornered the market on mean, complicated, <laughs> charming, <laughs> evil people. Yeah, I excel at that. Um, I want to ask you about that role in a moment, but I want to first ask you about Terrence McNally because he was such an important collaborator. Um, and he, the the story I've heard, and I don't know if it's apocryphal, was that you were performing in a show um, in New York, and it was okay. It wasn't well received. And Frankie and Johnny was also being performed at the same theater. And you were sort of at the end of the night. One night, you were sort of sitting on the steps outside. No, this the was an afternoon. Afternoon. This was uh, what? What's at the, the story? Manhattan, I was in the Manhattan Theater Club lobby. Yeah. And we, I had just gone through. Uh, we were inside the, with this play and claptrap, um, right? Well, yeah. I, I don't, the author has asked me not to reference I it see. anymore. Sorry. Okay. But <clears throat> we were doing this play. <laughs> it wasn't going so well, and at one point. The, uh, the director said, you know what I think the problem is? The lights are too bright. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I think that's the problem. They can see the play. <laughs> so then they called like for a break for five minutes. And I went outside. And I was sitting on the steps in the lobby of the Manhattan Theater Club at City Center. And yes, uh, Terrence's play, Frankie and Johnny, was playing in the smaller theater next door. Uh, with Murray Abraham and Kathy Bates, and uh, it was a big hit. And I had my head in my hands, and it, this very kind gentleman came up to me and said, Hi, I'm Terrence McNally. I know you're having some problems with your show, but, you know, I just want to tell you I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, and I hope we get to work together someday. Wow. And you'd never met him before? No. Wow. No. But you, of course, knew who he was. I mean, he was a legend. Oh, uh, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. And um, and then, what year was that? And then a few years later, uh, he put two years in. later, I was do doing the Lisbon Traviata in wow. in, uh, in that same theater where it wasn't going so well. Yes, um, <clears throat> it changed that again, another life changing experience. A, a kind of a pivotal. Terrence. I mean, he he saw you as a almost like as a muse. Well, I think, you know, he, yes, he once said that, but I, you know, I think he had many muses and, and he was, uh, and, and he was really my muse, but he, you know, there was just an instant chemistry and understanding of, I understood his writing. Uh, and, 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 you know, he always said, oh, we, you know, we never have to discuss anything because, which isn't quite true, but you know, we never. I don't have to tell him this is what I meant or how to play something. He he understands uh, innately what to do, and and um, and also he just wrote this. You know, uh, they for some reason they were having trouble casting that part in the Lisbon Traviata, um, and which was shocking to me. Um, and the part you play with Mendy. Mendy, yes, Mendy Wage. Well, oh, I should say, that. well, it's based on a man named Mendy Wager, Michael Wager, uh, who was an actor and friend of 
and a, and, and, and for people don't know, opera obsessive and for people don't yeah. know the play it's it, he's like this obsessed with Maria Callas he's this very sort of camp flamboyant character yeah yeah although he wouldn't like to be accused of that. sorry uh, but but yeah <laughs> I once met the real Mendy at a party at Betty Comden's apartment a Christmas party and he came up to me and he said uh Hello, Nathan. He had this very deep voice. He was the voice of the Met for years. This is Michael Wager for PBS. And he came up to me and he said, Hello, Nathan. I'm the real Mendy. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, yes. I said, well, oh, it's so nice to meet you. I, I, want, I said, I have to thank you for inspiring one of the greatest parts I, I've ever had. And he said... Well, it was a very painful experience for mm. me. And mm. then, you know, because originally Oof. when they first, when he first wrote the play, I don't think I've ever talked about this, but when he first wrote the play, they hired Mendy to play Mendy. Wow. And then they realized he wasn't like the best actor, <laughs> but they didn't fire him until the end of the week because he was the only one who had a recording of Zeffirelli in a documentary talking about Collis, and they want they wanted to get it from him. <laughs> then they did, and then they fired him. <laughs> so yeah, the the production, you know, they did it off off Broadway, and then they were, you know, and then they were doing it at Manhattan Theater Club, where he had established a, a relationship with the theater and with um, it's only a play, I you believe. Know, you know, your description of going to Chicago and how it kind of tr helped to transform you as an actor. Um, it changed everything. Yeah. And and I think Even that how I approached the work and how everything it was. Uh, it was really uh, an incredible experience. And I imagine that working with Terrence McNally also had a similar impact on how you thought of yourself as an actor. I mean, yeah, well, how, both how so? he both he and, and the director, John Tillinger, um, Really, with John Tillinger in particular, was the first person who saw me as an actor and not just as a comic. Because Tillinger cast me first in Robbie Bates's first play in New York, The Film Society, which we did at Second Stage, and then this when it, it came up, uh, the, Terrence's play, The Lisbon Traviata, and they wanted a much older man, and then. Joey, um, that that's what people call him, Joey. John Tellinger said, well, what about Nathan? And everybody said, oh, he's too young. But at this point, let's just bring him in. And then, you know, it was uh, kismet. But, uh, but yeah, both Terrence and, and, and John Tellinger were the ones who, you know, it changed everything. It changed how, pe it changed how people looked at me. And as in the theater, and it was like I was sort of after the Lisbon Traviata, I was led into the club, and and then Terence was incredibly uh, generous, and he had lost um, both Jimmy Coco and Robert Drivers, who were collaborators, uh, and he felt he said to me, "It's like you came into my life to." replace them and I want to I want to create things for you roles for you and it was unbelievable that someone of his stature and and talent would say that to a young actor and uh so yeah that was uh um uh, an amazing time Nathan I want I want to ask you about how you about sort of how you approach certain roles and I want to ask about I'm going to ask about three obvious ones. They're the roles that you won Tony Awards for. But before I ask you about Roy Cohen, I want to ask you about you know your roles in in a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum and and playing Max Bialystok and the producers. What's remarkable is I know that as a kid you really idolized Zero Mostel, and you would go on to revive these two iconic characters that many people would have said only Zero Mostel could 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 be this character. I think at some point you even felt. He could, only he could be Max Bialystok, and yet you not only revived them, but you you completely reinterpreted those characters and became those characters. Um, how? Tell me your approach on becoming 
I'm becoming Max Bialystok, for example. When, when, when you know that that's this iconic role that was sort of embodied, personified by this one man, and then you take it on and you've got to reinterpret it, how do you approach that? Um, well, <laughs> you know, when it came to Forum, you know, Forum was written for Phil Silvers. Mm. And then he turned it down because he thought it was too much of what he had been doing all his life, you know, playing Sergeant Bilko, essentially, in ancient Rome. And then they got Milton Berle, uh, who was announced, and then uh, that, that didn't work out, and then eventually someone suggested Zero, and he obviously made it his own. So Pseudolus is a, is a part that many people have played and can play, and, and, and uh, obviously Zero was brilliant in it, but... Um, but really, when Mel Brooks created the the producers, um, or as it originally called Springtime for Hitler, he um, it, there was only one person that he created Max Bialystok around Zero. And if Zero had said no, which I think he initially did, and or he he, um, he you know Mel had went to Zero's wife Kate and said please talk him into doing this and she did um you know i if 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 he hadn't done it i don't know whether there would have been a movie um perhaps but i can't imagine it without him so in many ways when you in doing the musical uh and because everybody you know comedy aficionados know this it was it was this famous cult classic um and you could quote all the dialogue and 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 you had never i had never seen anybody be that big on screen and yet uh, truthful as well and so in a sense you were you're not just playing max bialystok you're playing um zero mostel as well you have to bring a, that a kind of size operatic size to it and and uh I mean, it's it's um, it was, you know. I mean, it's 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 one of the great comic plots. I, I think one of the things was having Mel write it all, write the the book and the and the the score, was really crucial to it all it working and and um, but. But then, and there was uh, there was obviously the stuff we all know and love from the movie, and some of it worked on stage, and some of it didn't. And then, and then also a lot of new material, so which gave you, gave me as an actor, the opportunity to explore other sides of this character. Um, so, um, you know, the the approach is, you know, there was, you know, I I knew that. I mean, I I often wonder whether I should we should believe Mel when he says he says he worked for a Broadway producer who was like this, who little old ladies would come by and he would have sex with them <laughs> to get money out, get cash in the play, and you know make it out. The title of the play is Cash. Whether that actually happened, I'm not sure. It's a charming story. Uh, that Mel worked, young Mel Brooks worked for a Broadway producer, you know, and he, he used to, he said he was always in an alpaca coat. And, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, it's a weird combination of the film and the, and, and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, and then it's the, the producers is a kind of, the, the producers, the musical, it's like a museum of comedy. And and it demands it's very demanding on the performers and and uh, and you know that original company was just you know just tremendous and and uh, you know it was one of those it's just one of those times when every the right people all the right people were in the right place at the right time and the and the and you know and it was, it was like a zeitgeist hit it was just what the doctor ordered in terms of the public you know they it was just it was time to. You know, it was a, a musical comedy with the emphasis on the comedy, and and it was, uh, um, yeah, it was, um, you know, it's obviously, it's a love story. It's a father-son love story, and, and Bancroft, I remember saying to me, 
you know, the, he Mel lost his father when he was just in you know, like two or three or something, and, and that uh, many of his stories are father son stories. But he she thought because of that, and uh, and that's that's what the the producers is. It's this love story of you know of somebody who's never had a friend or doesn't have much fun in his life. This young accountant and this totally corrupt, conscience free <laughs> producer who sees a way out of his desperate situation with this one idea. Yeah. You know, it's a great, it's just, you know, it's, it's one of the most, it's one of the great comic plots. We'll put on the most offensive show <laughs> ever and then no one, we won't have to give the money back. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it becomes no, a hit, of course. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, so yeah, it is, it, there's no way around, you, you know, you have to, uh, fortunately, there was enough new material that it's you know it's not a, you're not doing exactly what Zero did, but it's it's but you there are certainly there are times in it where you have to sort of pay homage to to the the that level of intensity that Zero brought to it. Where do you find when, before you walk out on stage, okay, and you've got a I mean, is there a, a switch that flips in your head that you are that person? You are. Max Bialystok, you are Roy Cohen, or is it, do you have to spend hours before the show, you know, sort of in isolation focused, which, how do you, because you are Nathan Lane and you're this person that people know, and then you are this other person on stage. And so how do you make that transition? Do you, is there like something, a process you go through before you step well, out on the stage? Well, uh, obviously it depends on the, what, what the piece is. You know, if you're if you're entering as Hickey into a bar, uh, it's it's after after they've been on stage for an hour, there's 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 a great deal of preparation that goes into it um, and and getting in the right head space. But you know, it, it, there's a, this great thing that happens in a theater where everybody. We're all in on it, and you know the audience. We're all there. We're gonna we're gonna go somewhere together. We all make this bargain, and and uh, of and it and it's about our imaginations. Yeah, it's you know Walt, uh, <laughs> Walter Matthau once. Richard Benjamin told me they were doing a movie where they were doctors and. And he and he had, he had done a lot of research, and he said to Walter, "Did he do a lot of research for the?" And he said, "No." He said, "No." The audience knows I'm not a doctor. <laughs> they just accept because I'm wearing a white coat, and I'm a doctor. I don't have to do research. I just say the lines. Um, but you know, it, it it it's it's about the it's about the material, and and there are certain. It, it's so de each 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 one is different. Um, you know, I, I you know, uh, Angels in America. I was always in a slight panic because that opening scene is so difficult, and it, you're and you're you know you're balancing all these phone calls and on the and there's a lot of physical business with the phones and the and punch, punching buttons and you're doing it for the but you're you're doing it all for the benefit of this young guy who you want to impress with your power and you're trying to lure him into your world so that's what those are the things you concentrate on um what is what is, what does the guy want what does he need to accomplish in this scene what is it's it's sort of moment to moment it's about being present it's not there's not some you don't go into some chamber and magically become Roy Cohn but you you do these things that he's trying to do there are actions and objectives and you do all of that and slowly but surely you know uh, there's you there's a you know as as Judy Dench who who once famously played Cleopatra for uh, uh, Sir Peter Hall and was like saying I can I'm I'm not I'm so miscast and he's eh, how will I be able to do this and he said you don't have to show them everything in the first scene you show them a little bit and you show a little bit here and by the time you get to the end of the evening they will have seen Cleopatra um so 
you know, there's it's it's like that. You know, you, you know, you you're not going to you're not going to go out and show them everything uh, right off the bat. You know, and it's it uh, honestly it it depends on the, there's a, on the role and and what the the material and how you fit into the machine, um, what part you play in that, and and um, I mean you know there were times in uh, in Iceman, you know when you're you know in the, in the fourth act, which is what separates the men from the boys, when you're you know, just when you think the show is over and yeah. then he tells you the story of his life for 30 minutes and goes sort of insane. Um, you know, there were times it was like, it was, I was like, I was hallucinating. Cause I, you know, it, it, cause it's a, it's a very, it's a conversation, but it's mainly a one-sided conversation. And, and, but you're trying to convince a group of people that what you did was right. The fact that you murdered your wife was out of love for her in a strange way. And it's, it's, um, yeah, there are times when those times when you, when an audience is breathing as one, when there's that kind of, a kind of silence that you only hear in the theater. Well, you, you know, you could hear, as they say, a pin drop. And, and it's, and that's, that's the, the the allure that's the drug that keeps you going back because not every night is like that it does it isn't always that way and sometimes it's a little more technical and you know there are the times when you know you have to let everything go there are times you don't want to be there or you're tired sometimes those are the best performances when you're tired and you think i don't know i can't possibly do this again you know and then and it's also also about their participation how involved is the audience going to be? And if they're with you, you'll you'll you can do anything. They will they will they will lift you up, and you can you can it's you're not tired at all. It's that kind of you know. Is is there's a great there's a great interview, the great documentary about O'Neill, and at the end uh, they're interviewing uh, uh, Jason Robards, who was you know the gold standard, and he. He and he, you know, talks about O'Neill and says, you know, if you give him your very best at all times, it will work. Um, and he talked about working with Ralph uh, Ralph Richardson uh, in in the movie of uh, Long Day's Journey and and but but about about stage work and he's and R Richardson had said to him, well, this is when you go on stage, that's it's our time to dream. And and if so if all of those things are working, the acting and the the actors with each other and and the and the the, the text and the, you know it can you can at certain times sort of become that person. You know, hearing you talk about the allure of the audience and the energy of the audience, we haven't talked at all about your very um, long and extensive you know, uh, career as a film actor, uh, a completely, I mean, imagine if you, if you had to take Roy Cohen to the, the, to the screen or take Max Bialystok with, for a, a revival of the producers as a film, you've done many films, obviously the birdcage, many, many people love that film. I love that film. It's an amazing role, but it's a completely different, it must be just a totally different almost like you're doing a different job like you're in a different profession when you're performing in front of a camera right um yes and no um you know if you were doing Roy Cohn on film as Al Pacino did it would be very it would be different you know, when 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 uh, National Theater they have this thing, National Theater Live, where they film the stage performance. I you know I've been involved with those where they filmed the man who came to dinner, or they filmed uh, for the, for National Theater Live, Angels in America, and or even uh, the Nance we did for PBS as well for Live from Lincoln Center and. You know, you suddenly you're faced with oh, there are all these cameras, and but but you're 
they're filming a play. They're filming a live performance. So it's a it's a different animal. You're you're not you're not doing it for a camera. You're doing it for the people who are there for that audience. So it is it that's very different. Uh, you know, taking things that you've done on stage and putting them on film is, you know, the uh, um, the the film version of the musical, the producers was, you know, I, my joke at the time was it was the most expensive Lincoln Center archive recording ever done. Um, but it was a that was a case where, um. You know, Mel loved the show so much. And then he and Tom Meehan, you know, basically he said to Susan Stroman, just film the show, which was not a good idea. And um, and the, he didn't really rework the what was the libretto for the musical into a screenplay. He didn't turn it back into a movie. He just said to her, film the show, which is what happened. And when I got the screenplay, I, I was doing the show in London and, uh, and I read it and I, and I said to her, well, this is what I'm doing here. It hasn't been reimagined as a film. Um, you know, some of this, we can't do some, some of this with the, the usherettes in the beginning. It was funny on stage because it was like a, an old, hoary old musical review. And the audience is singing about, you know, it's sort of like you have to think about, oh, what's, maybe it opens with the, the end of Funny Boy. And you see a little bit of that musical and it's a disaster and he's in the back. And then, you know, and, and, and then slowly it, it leads into the, you know, King of Broadway or something. You know, it has to be reimagined. Yeah. Well, well, it wasn't. We did the show on film, and um, and it was very, it, it that material. You know, it's there's you. I don't know how you do the small independent film version of the producers. Yeah. You know, it's either it's gonna you know zero zero was pretty big. It's gonna be big. <laughs> I remember Matthew saying to me, "I don't know what to do." I, I, it's the same material. I don't know how to do this other than how we did it. Uh, you know, we could not do certain things and, and we were sort of trapped. Um, if you had done the show, you, you felt a, a bit trapped. Like, I don't know, I don't know how else to do. Um, never put your own money in the show unless you yell the second, never put your own money in the show. Um, that's how, how, that's how the gag works. And so it's, it's you either, they, people are going to accept that or it's that it's like, oh, this is like the film version of little Abner. It's mm -hmm. big, it's big comedy, but you know, ultimately I, I, I don't think it worked as a film, as a film musical, but it, you know, it sort of, it captured something of what the, the show was like, but not the kind of the anarchy of the stage show and that like anything could happen feel of it was that it had in the theater, which was like a party. Yeah. You never knew what was going to happen. Is, is being in front of an audience and feeling that energy, does it make it in a strange way easier than, 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 than being in a film and, and speaking to a camera where you don't have that feedback? No, no, it's easier to, <laughs> to do it without them. But so because when you're on stage, it is, you all have to work together and you have to control them to a certain degree. Sometimes, you know, they'll want to take the show away from you. We don't want we don't want it to be so serious or we don't you know, they you never know. It, it's it, they they are an active participant in the evening and they are the other cast member. And an entire group of 1,200 people turn into one per huge personality that you have to deal with. And even in the more – the most serious things, there's always a little antenna uh, that you're tracking. You know, are they with it? Are they listening? Have, uh, are they a little bored? Is there is – there, you know, it's just – it's about keeping a large group of people from coughing. It's that. And, and, uh, um, so they, it, it is a major part of it. So yeah, it's no, it's much easier on film to not think about any of that. I'm, I'm curious about the character of Roy Cohn. I know you've talked about, um, you know, 
about that character and the complexity of that man. Um, uh, you know, because to some he sort of personifies evil, but but uh, but a lot of complexity there. Who he was, uh, he was Jewish. He sort of hated being Jewish. He was gay. He hated. He was not. It was completely closeted. Um, um, died of AIDS and never um, had acknowledged it. Um, even you know, all the way to the end, um, was. Um, you know, brutally, you know, sort of famously pr- prosecutorial and, 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 and responsible in many ways for the execution of the Rosenbergs. Um, when, when, you, when you had yeah. the opportunity to play this character, because a lot of people are going to see you playing this character and they're, they're going to be like, whoa, Nathan Lane, that's not the person I'm used to seeing on stage. Here he is playing this character. This is not Max Bialystok. This is a different Nathan Lane. Um, how did you, how did you sort of, you know, think about, you know, how did you sort of approach that role and and think about, you know, just becoming that person who was so reviled? Well, look, it begins and ends with uh, Tony Kushner. Mm. Uh, first of all, you're it's uh, it's Tony Kushner's Roy Cohn. And so Tony gives you a lot. And, uh, and I would venture to say that he's uh, – Tony Kushner's Roy Cohn is a lot more interesting and charming and f- funnier than the real Roy Cohn. If you've seen Roy, the real Roy Cohn interviewed. Um, and then there are moments that are like – there's a there's – a, uh, this famous, there was a famous a couple of sixty minutes pieces. He did two of them, one towards the end of his life. But there's, I remember there's this one where he's in the back of his Rolls Royce with a some gangster, some mob boss, Tony, two ton Tony somebody, and uh, he said, and he's saying to him, "Now you didn't, you didn't do these things they said you did, did you?" And he says, "No, I did not." And it, it's it's almost like um, it's something out of the play. Um, um, he was, uh, you know, it's interesting to talk. To, I talked to some people who were friends with him, who loved him, and uh, I. There's only there's not a lot to read. I mean, he he wrote an autobiography with this guy Sidney Zion questionable uh, journalist and and uh, which is hilarious and so there's only one book Citizen Cone I, they, they made a television film out of it with James Woods but um, the, the first two chapters uh, cover the last two years of his life the first chapter I should say I'm sorry and and that's you know was the basis for a lot of what I did because it had a lot of uh, the hospital records and his behavior in the hospital, and and um, and 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 talked about some physical things that happened to him that I wanted to use in the in the second half uh, in Perestroika, um, which is watching his the, his disintegration, which I felt I hadn't quite seen seen that. Uh, in, in in terms of what I read about and with him, with um, he had you know he had a tremor, he would, he had a tremor that would travel from his shoulder to to one hand to the other hand, and, yeah. and that if he was talking to someone, he would hold his hand and stop it from shaking, while he was talking to someone trying to control everything. And um, so I thought that was interesting, and also that he had thrush. So I wanted to do something where. Uh, and in Perestroika, where you haven't seen him for a while, and then the next, there's this big scene with Joe Pitt, and when he's he's in he's in a ho- the hospital bed, and his voice is now weakened, and he talks to him, and um, so I wanted to do those certain physical things. I mean, you know, you re- it's all sort of in his childhood. Yes, he was a self-loathing Jew, self-loathing homosexual, um, and. Look, those people um, don't. <laughs> I know people see him as evil. He, everyone has said he was evil, and he did a lot of 
reprehensible things. But, you know, those people don't see it that way. They're, they're in the right. Uh, and they're very positive about it. And, they're, and they're, they're charming. They're seductive. You know, they're, they're many, many, many things. They're not just, you, you know, so, you're, so it's, it's a, that combination of things. But, you know, Kushner gives you so much. I mean, there were times, uh, that was a play as, you know, it was, you're talking when you did the whole thing was seven and a half hours. And, uh, but the way he's, that, in, in particular, that part, the way it's laid out, the architecture of Roy Cohn in that play is, he, there's, he gives you lots of, rest and and, you know you you know there's that opening scene and then and then at the end of that particular act it's one of the greatest scenes ever written it's it's as good as you know anything in death of a salesman or the the scene with the doctor who tells him he has aids and he and he explains to him he couldn't possibly have aids and it's it's every every single performance i was like i you know i would sit there and and you can take it in so many different ways and so you know it, it was just the the greatest it's it's you know i'm th- so thrilled i got to do it it's one of the greatest plays and greatest parts ever written and yeah. you you never got bored there was no it was always inspiring and you i was like i can't believe i i'm going to get to do this again and figure this out again how am i going to what am i going to do when the doctor when this doctor says that and uh, it's um, fascinating. It's just, the you know, so again, it's, you know, you do all that your preparation and reading and research. And now, you know, I don't know, what did we do without Google? And you, you read all this stuff and you look at all this stuff on YouTube, of footage of him. And, and, then, and then you take all of that in and then you have that. And then you have those words. And it's, it's uh, and then, you know, as, as my friend Brian Dennehy who gave me, who sort of gave me the best advice when we were doing Iceman. And he said, um, I said to him after the, you know, in Chicago, it's, you have nine previews and then all the critics come to the first, <laughs> to that preview and review you based on nine performances of Iceman, which is like nothing. But after the reviews, I said to Brian, what do you, t- you pl- you've played this part. Tell me, tell me something. Give me some notes, anything. And he said, um, he said, you're doing a great job, kid. He said, uh, yeah, uh, the part is so impossible and enormous. He said, you had to map it out the way you did just to get your bearings. And he said, what, what I would say is, now throw it all away. Wow. Just let the play happen hmm. to you and see hmm. where that takes you. Hmm. And so then the rest of that uh, time in Chicago was just, it was a, just a great um uh, uh, adventure of, of playing that show and getting comfortable with it and then trying different things and, and you know, having little breakthroughs here and there. And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I just, I, you know, that when you, when the material is that profound and, and dense and you, you know, there these things, you know, like Roy Cohn, you know, I, I mean, you could play, I could play those, those kinds of roles. You could play forever because it's endlessly interesting and fascinating. And then, you know, you're sort of also, as you're discovering, you're trying to pare it down, you, you know, to keep it simple and, and, uh, economical and, and with, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard and it's hard too, because there are, you know, people like Roy Cohn are, filled with rage <laughs> um which is also kind of you know fun you get all that stuff out you know it strikes me i mean here you are you're in your mid 60s and you have had a very long career you've won 3 tonys and it strikes me that i mean not only are do you always work to get better as an actor because i think you are con- still getting better as an actor but it strikes me that you are looking for challenges to help you become a better actor. Totally. Oh yeah. I'm always looking for the next mountain to climb. Um, and, uh, yes, you know, it's that thing of, uh, you know, you want to have, 
you want to be scared. You want, I don't know if I can do this, but I have to try. Otherwise, why am I an actor? Why am I doing this? If I'm not going to take, if I haven't gotten to that point where I can, you can take that risk, you know, and try different things, you know, something that's a big swing that people might not think of you for and and uh but to take on that kind of challenge and, you know is it, it it goes back to this you know i had this before i did ice man like about nine years before i'd had a this conversation with ken brana in a bar where we talked about this these kinds of roles he's and he certainly has played many of them and he said uh and he was incredibly encouraging and then he finally said you know nathan you you can't you can't just talk about them. You actually have to go somewhere and do them. Yeah. And, and, and he said, it doesn't matter what people will say. And believe me, they'll have opinions. But what you will learn from taking on these kinds of roles, climbing these kinds of mountains, will be invaluable and life-changing. And it turned out to be true. Nathan Lane, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to my conversation with Nathan Lane on The Great Creators. To find out more, go to thegreatcreators.com slash lane, where we post links to tons of things we talked about in this interview. Also, please do subscribe to this channel and click the bell to get notifications every time a new episode comes out. We've got tons and tons more coming. Thanks for watching. And as always, you can also hear us as a podcast. You can find The Great Creators wherever you listen to podcasts.